Good evening, World Changers. It's Pastor Wes. Welcome to Saturday Night Service. I want to welcome our partners, our E-Family, our World Changers Nation, and of course, the beloved World Changers Church, New York. Welcome to Saturday Night Service. We're going to have an awesome time in the Word. Let's get right into this. Uh, we're going to do communion, as we always do, putting ourselves in remembrance. After a long week, it can be tiresome. It can be feel like you're beat up and burned up from life. And it's a good moment to take a pause and step back and think, Man, God is still good. God is still amazing. And what all has Jesus done in my life? And what are all the bad things that could have happened that didn't happen? And just get in this place of gratefulness before you get into the Word of God. And allow this moment to shift you on over into that place of, let me receive what the Spirit of God has to say to me tonight. So as you take this, whatever you may have around the house, it's okay. Um, you take this bread. Let's see if I can get it out myself. Take this bread. It reminds you of the body of Jesus. And that's what we put in remembrance. It says, by His stripes, we are healed. So if you're experiencing sickness or disease, after effects from coronavirus, any of those things that you may be elements hitting your body, I want you to receive healing right now. I want you to receive divine life. For those of you taking this, say, I feel great. Believe for the person next to you. Believe for the person that's taking this, you may be virtually connecting to. We're all going to come in agreement right now and declare healing over our church. So as you take this, receive wholeness for your physical body, and you can eat. As you take this juice, it represents the blood of Jesus and reminds us that we're forgiven. I want you to let go of every bit of shame, every bit of guilt, every bit of condemnation, and allow yourself to be forgiven. God's already forgiven you. I'm not holding anything against you. Most of the people around you, I'm sure, that really genuinely love you aren't holding anything against you. Forgive yourself. Let it go yourself right now. The thing you did this week, the thing you might have did a couple minutes ago, whatever it is, let it go so you can focus on this word and realize you're forgiven. So as you take this, no, no more condemnation, no more guilt and shame, and you can drink. All right, let's pray and get right on into this word. Heavenly Father, we come before you and we thank you for a, a night of transformation, a night of mind renewal, a night of vision, a night of just encouragement, a night of hope, a night of just believing in this new season of our church that we're going into, that we're experiencing only your best, that we're just thriving and growing and you're giving us the wisdom how to navigate the seasons and the time and every situation that's going on in our nation right now and in our world and in our city, Father, we declare all is well that anything going on around us, it will not come on us, Father, that you keep us shielded and protected. Father, I submit and yield myself to you to allow the Holy Spirit to articulate my words, to inspire utterance that is divinely from heaven, to order my steps and speak a divine word that's from you, about you, and paint a clear picture of Jesus. Father, I give honor to our spiritual parents, Pastor Creflo and Taffy Dollar, and I thank you for the honor it is to minister to your precious people. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, guys, let's get into this. So really, uh, I'm on part four, and I've been doing a series called Where Do We Go Now? In this new season of our church, um, stepping into this role as senior pastor with Nicole and I doing this together, uh, it, it's been vision casting again is what the whole purpose of this is. And making sure everybody's aware of the vision and the direction we're going, reminding people of the vision, the vision of world changers. And of course, we're going to come back to this. We're going to build on this later. We might go another week, but... I really wanted to sink in some foundational things of what is the next step our church needs to step into, especially coming back together, to get people excited about World Changers. I believe people are, but to really ignite the passion about that again and what we're doing here. So you can make a, a, a quality decision too to say, man, I want to be a part of this. I want to recommit myself to this. I want to invest into this. I want to do my part. I want to serve. I want to give because I want to see what I believe in this church change lives. And that's why I want to recast the vision for you here is what I'm doing. So tonight I'm talking about the culture and mentality of our vision at our church. Pastor, and I encourage you to go back and listen to, as I've said every week now, August 20th, the first preached a powerful message. And inside of it was a lot of nuggets. And I've been emphasizing those. It was a lot around vision. It was a lot around what we do. He talked about uh, servanthood. So tonight I'm actually going to kind of spring off that. The culture and the mentality that we create at World Changers Church in New York is a culture of serving others. Now, 
In the moment right there, you think I'm talking about, well, let me become an usher. Let me become a vision keeper. Let me become a part of the media department. Let me become a part of the praise team department. And so on and so on and so on with all these wonderful departments. I encourage you to do that, especially as we open back up and gather. Uh, but it's more than that. It's a mindset. It's a culture. And it's a heartbeat. And it's ultimately we're serving God. And we get to serve God as where He places and put us, which is inside of World Changers. That my job is to serve World Changers and this city and the area we're in. But let me take it a little further when I talk about serving others. What does that look like? And that's what I want to talk to you about tonight. Many times we say, I can say serving others. People are like, yeah, I do that. And then I could ask, well, what is, how do you do that? What does that look like? And it's not necessarily right or wrong answer that I get, but I get a lot of different answers. But I want us to all to have the same core value and foundation. We may serve in different lanes and positions, but the heartbeat should be very similar. So let's get into this tonight. In our example, as we talked about Jesus as the head of the church and the Word made flesh, and that we tie all grace because we're getting to understand grace, which is a person which will empower us to change, uh, we, we need to look at how Jesus served because He was the most accurate the true accuracy of how servanthood looked, because that's what he did. So let's go over to Martha, uh, almost said Martha, Matthew 20. Matthew 20 is what I want to go to. Matthew 20. Familiar passage, but I want to talk about it again, because there's some things that's going to come out. Let's start in verse 20. And let's go to verse 28. Verse 20 said, The mother of James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Probably said that wrong, but hey, uh, it might be right. I'll have to go back and check. Came to Jesus with her sons. She knelt respectfully to ask a favor. What is your request? Jesus asked her. She replied, in your kingdom, please let my two sons sit in places of honor next to you. One on your right and the other on your left. Sounds like a pretty good mom at first. But Jesus answered saying, you don't know what you are asking. Are you able to drink from the bitter cup of suffering I'm about to drink? Oh, yes, they replied. We're able. Jesus told them, you will need, you will indeed drink from my bitter cup, but I have no right to say who will sit on my right hand or my left. My father has prepared those places for the one, ones he has chosen. And really what people can get caught up in the doctrine. Jesus is just like, that's not relevant. And that's what I need you to hear. Things like that especially in this time and on this earth and this season, are not relevant. Verse 24, when the ten other disciples heard that James and John had asked us, they were ticked off. They were really upset. They were PO'd, pardon the language, but they were mad. But Jesus called them together and said, You know what? You know that the rulers in this world lord it over their people, and officials flaunt their authority over those under them. Now, let's pause here. Let me... Back up, reread this again. I want you to catch the contrasting heartbeats here. How do you recognize when you're serving in the right capacity, the right foundation, the right heartbeat, or not? Jesus is giving the perfect examples right here. Let's read this again in verse 25. But Jesus called them together and said, this is a good teaching moment. You know that the rulers in this world lord it over their people. And officials flaunt their authority over those under them. But among you, it will be different. So we're seeing what not to do. When we lord it over people, when we flaunt it, when we boast, when we're arrogant. And everybody had somebody pop in front of their head in that moment. And my mission is to make sure you're not doing that more than anything. Mind your own business. Focus on your own work. We talked about that last week. To make sure this isn't getting in your heart. This is about being seen. This is about being, let me elevate myself other other people. Jesus said, we got to do the opposite of that. See, the world, and, and when I say world, carnality and self-centeredness will say lift yourself. Jesus said lift others above yourself. Now, verse 26, But among you it will be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must become your slave or servant. I know that can be a little bit of a trigger word. It's not in that context of just that it says right there that we would think in our day and time. So I'm about being a servant to others. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, 
But this, even Jesus came not to be served, saying, I'm leading by example, but to serve others and give his life as a ransom for many. So this is the example we have from Jesus. So what are we dealing with? He's dealing with a heart condition here. He's dealing with a heart condition here. How are you using your ability to serve? How are you using your position? You know, what, what, makes, a, what makes the difference in a, a lot of times and the, the type of pastor you have is, is this pastor lording over others, is controlling others, is dominating others, is mistreating others. Well, that doesn't make the role of a pastor bad. That makes the individual in the role of the pastor doing bad. Versus the pastor has to realize the servant. Not for abuse, not for pastor abuse, not to work themselves to death, but you're there to serve people, not elevate yourself above people. You're there to lead in the ability to serve, and everybody follows that same lead. That's what Jesus was saying. Serve as I serve. Um, and that's where we talk about the difference with Jesus here, and I'm, I know I'm reiterating. It's one, Jesus is our example, but Jesus said, I'm, I'm not here to serve myself. I'm not here to be self-centered. I'm here to serve others. Well, well how, where does this start? It starts in your home, first of all. I have to remind myself many times, and I'm, as, a, as a newer husband, almost in my, uh, going on my second year now of marriage, you know, sometimes I have to remember I'm so busy serving my church, I forget to serve as a husband. And I have to catch myself sometimes where I have to balance those things, to remember to serve as a dad and not let those things get out of whack and out of order is mostly what I say. To remember I'm serving in all things because really my home is my main practicing ground before I even get to church about serving. Now I'm going to talk to you about the benefits of serving. What comes out of that? Why should I serve? What, Pastor West, why should I do this? We're going to answer some of those questions Get in that. So as we looked how Jesus served though first before we get into some of those benefits, how did Jesus really serve? If I'm supposed to serve like Jesus, what does that really look like? Well, first thing is, Jesus served with no discrimination. I don't discriminate. Everybody discriminates at some point. Well, that person don't smell as good. I'm maybe not going to serve them the same way. Let me keep my distance. That woman's skirt is a little too revealing. We're not going to make sure we serve her with the same service as she comes to the church. It's easier to do when you think, oh, that person smells like weed. We're not going to go shake their hands when they come through the church. I mean, come on, guys, it's easier to do more than you want to make it about race or anything, those other things. They're even in the subtle things, the little things. The biggest thing church discriminates on is how holy you appear will serve you based on that. And you start playing favorites and favoritism. You start serving the people that you click better with and you have a better personality, but then you treat the other people you don't quite like as much. You treat them like garbage then your serving is, is, is worthless at that point. You're serving just to be seen. Jesus talked about this. Anyone can be kind to people they like. Anyone can love your friend. But how can you love someone you consider your enemy? So in James 2, let me go over there. James 2, verse um, 1 is what I'm going to go to. As you're like, well, I don't think Jesus served like that. Well, let's see what the half-brother of Jesus had to say James did about that, that he learned. My dear brothers and sisters, how can you claim to have faith in, the, in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ if you set favor some people over others? For example, suppose someone comes into your meeting dressed in fancy clothes and expensive jewelry, and another comes in poor and dressed in dirty clothes. If you give special attention and good seats to the rich person, but you say to the poor one, you can stand over there or sit over there, uh, sit on the floor. Well, doesn't this discrimination show that your judgments are guided by evil motives? That's a cautious. When we, come, when we have people come into our church, you need to know these things. We don't need to tell you, well, I need you to serve in this church. And you don't know the first thing of what that looks like. I'm giving you some indicators right here. Jesus never served with discrimination. Jesus served with unconditional mercy. Let's go over to Luke 7. Jesus served with unconditional mercy, unconditional love, unconditional forgiveness. 
7, chapter 7, verse 47. It's towards the bottom. I'm jumping to the, the end of the, the whole thing, but it's really good if you go back and read all the way through it there. But verse 47 says, I tell you, her sins, this is a woman that um, was uh, wiping her hair and her tears on Jesus' feet and came into her, and the uh, Pharisee in that house was all like, what the heck, if this man was really a man of God, he'd know not to let this woman sin or touch him. Touch him. So he says, I tell you, her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven. So she has shown me much love, but a person who is forgiven little shows only little love. Little love. Then Jesus said to the woman, your sins are forgiven. Now here's what I actually wanted you to read uh, here. The men at the table, in verse 49, said among themselves, Who is this man that he goes around forgiving sins? Jesus has a reputation for that. He served. He came to be served. He didn't turn away that woman. He didn't reject that woman because she was known as, quote unquote, a sinner. And he even said her sins are many, but he treated her with respect. He treated her with dignity. He treated her with honor is what he did. And he loved on her. And he gave her the gift of forgiveness right there on the spot. Just gave her free love. That's how Jesus served. That's a reflection how we serve. Let me keep it moving. Jesus came to give others the advantage. Now, this is a big one. Jesus came to give others the advantage. We like to put me first all the time. We like to say, let me take the advantage. Let me take the advantage. And instead of giving others the advantage to be inconvenienced. Let me tell you, so many times people will get up and start serving at first and they'll be like, well, that's an inconvenience to me. Well, if you're not willing to take the inconvenience, who are you placing the inconvenience on? The other person. And our job is to alleviate others' inconvenience even when it inconveniences us. Realize I said inconvenience. I didn't say abuse because people are like, oh, I, don't, I shouldn't ever be inconvenienced. Then you're a self-centered person that don't know the first thing about serving or the love of God. You've got to know how to step out of your self-centeredness and give others the advantage. Give others preferential treatment is what that is. And we all have to work towards that. You know, we teach our kids to share. Teach your kids, well, let them play with the toy first, then you afterwards. Most parents do that automatically. That's teaching our kids ahead of time while they're little, give others the advantage. And we have to grow in that as church. We have to grow in that and let other people, it's like let them go first in line sometimes. Give them the special access. Give them the better seats in the church instead of us. You know, if we're serving, let them sit up on the front. You know, it was like August 21st. I, I remember we had the front row sectioned off, the very, very front row, and it was me, it was Nicole going to be there, It was because uh, we had to do the presentation for that, and we had Pastor Taffy up there on the front, and we we're going to have our, our ministers, Greg and Misha from the Brooklyn Church, and uh, all the front, and I told our head usher, I said, because we had a seating capacity limit, I said, if we max out on seats, and this row that's all that's left, I said, move all of us and put the people that are coming in so we don't have to turn them away. Why? Because my mindset is, um, where are you going to sit? We can stand in the back if we have to, and then we'll come out. Whatever, we'll put a few seats up in the back, and we'll sit in the back if we need to. Why? So they can have the advantage of coming in. Why? Because it's not all about us. It's not all about us all the time. And so it's, it's constantly not taking advantage of every little thing. You know, I've seen ministers come in, and it's like, you know, even me, myself, it's like uh, with this whole new change, and uh, people are going to ask, you know, hey, you need pre uh, protection agents around you. You know, because Dr. Dollar, they, they do for certain reasons. And people are like, why is that? Because, you know, hey, people have literally threatened multiple times to take their lives um, and have made attempts and things like that. But we don't get into that side of it. But people are like, you need protection agents. No. Now, if somebody starts threatening my life, uh, please don't, by the way. I'm big, please don't do that. I don't, I don't have any qualms with anybody. But or, or live in fear of it on the other hand. But if, if somebody starts to, of course, maybe that'll be the day. But it's like, no, because those resources can be placed elsewhere. But I don't need a luxury of that. There's been times, you know, and I'm giving an example not to toot my own horn, but I'm talking about serving because I'm careful also. I don't want people to know, well, Wes did this and this and that. No, no, no. Just to be seen, this ain't about being seen. It's giving examples. 
It's like we have a, a driver um, over our transportation department, Brother Richard. Amazing man of God, just serves faithfully. Gosh, that man gives so much. And he originally was pretty much was driving Dr. Dahl and past Taffy around. And part of the reason, it, you know, I say this, he was like, well, I'll make sure I drive you around, Wes, and this and that. And I'm like, Richard, I can drive myself. I'll drive myself. Why? Because you need to take care of other things. The man had one, a lot of other things to do, take care of the vehicles, take care of Dr. Dollar, pass Taffy, handle all those things. I can drive myself. I don't need that because we'll give the advantage elsewhere. And that's not saying ever I, I couldn't allow somebody to drive myself. Occasionally, Rich has come by like, Wes, you know, I just want to bless you. I got time, man. Let me bring you over here and drop you off. And I'm like, cool, Rich, it'll be good to catch up with you. And we've done that before, but saying, well, I need you to drive me everywhere, this and that, because, you know, I'm the minister and I'm the pastor here and you better take care of me and do all this stuff and da da. That's not living an example of servanthood. So each one of those things, we have to learn to give people the advantage is what I'm saying of that. Giving the advantage, me as a pastor, not to drain all the resources just because I'm the pastor and let those resources say, hey, you know what, maybe Richard will set up a transportation and, and say, why don't you help drive other members so then get back and forth in church and I'll drive myself to church. Why? Because I need to give the advantage elsewhere where it's needed, not be taking the advantage all the time. So that's the part about living in service. That, what, where did you get that from though, Wes? Jesus. Because I saw him give that. And if anybody had the reason to make demands and say me first, it was Jesus, God in flesh. And if God could, didn't even do it, what gives me any right to do it? What gives any of us any right to do it? Um, you know, moving right along here. So Jesus, oh, here we go. Jesus served with the intent to ease suffering. That's, that'll get people mad right there if you don't understand grace. Jesus served with the intent to ease suffering. Let's go over to Acts. Let's go to chapter 10, verse 38. It's just one account of many, by the way. If you follow the whole ministry of Jesus, you will clearly pick up this was his heartbeat. But verse 38 says clearly here, And you know that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. Then Jesus went around doing good in healing all who were oppressed or suffering by the devil, for God was with him. See, Jesus went around saying, how can I relieve your suffering? How can I relieve your pain today? How can I make life easier? We do that around our church all the time. How do we help people get in and out of the building? How do we help our people in wheelchairs get in and out, you know, to make their life easier so they don't have to be inconvenienced. How do we help our single moms that got kids to get back and forth or make sure they got what they need? Um, there, there's so many different areas. How do we help families that need help paying their loved ones of our members that have gone home to be with the Lord and helping to ease the financial burdens? Um, how do we do, you know, so many areas to ease the suffering of people? Jesus clearly served to ease the suffering of people. Taking that extra moment to pray with someone who's heartbroken or going through something or taking that extra moment to, to pay someone's bills that, you know, they're trying to make the ends meet. And it's like they don't know what they're going to do next month, honestly. But man, just to give them enough to ease off this month so maybe they can figure it out next month to do those different things. Jesus went around serving to ease other people's suffering to make, try to make life easier. He got involved with certain things. He did not stand idly by. And as a church, if we're going to serve and also even serve our community, we're aiming to ease people's suffering. Now, some people are going to get frustrated because they're like, man, we should be doing more. We should be doing more. If you get caught up in the sh we should be doing more mentality, you are going to be very self-destructive and destructive with the vision and the hope and how we're progressing. The truth is, everybody knows there's always more work to do. Because suffering is an ever ongoing thing as long as the earth is spinning round. So there will never be an end to suffering till Jesus comes back. So what do you do? You take as much resources and as much ability and much grace as God has given you the ability and charged you with and start with there. And it starts, it starts, um, it starts small sometimes. You know, for example, this back to school, we had a size up where we were in this new transition and season. 
we were able to do 240 backpacks. That's the starting place. Well, and, and so in that moment, you know, we do 240 backpacks given out to kids and stuff. And we say, well, there's still, you know, thousands and thousands of kids, you know, that do backpacks and da da da. They need this and need that. We did as much as we are able to this time. And we give God thanks for the ability that we were able to do the 240, knowing that's not the end, though. Knowing that next year, man, let's shoot to raise another hundred or two. And we grow each year and we increase in year. But don't we get caught up in the more. And what can happen is we diminish. And we tell what people did because there was people that gave that day. There was the, the gifts that you guys sown just monetarily gifts as financial gifts that are able to able enable us to pay. So all of a sudden when you say a lot of times that we need to do more, you're saying what people did in the finance they give, you kind of halfway spit on it. And see, it's saying, hey, we did what we could. And that's what God is asking from us. Being faithful with the little and doing what we can, and it will increase. But it's being consistent also with that. So when we're, when we're getting caught, when Jesus served to end suffering, Jesus clearly, even in His time, didn't end the world of all suffering. He was a busy man. They said they couldn't even contain in all the books in the world. Had never contained all the works he did in three years, by the way. So if he wasn't able to end it, hey, our job isn't to get caught up on that side of it. Our job is to be faithful with what we have, serve to the maximum of our ability, call it a day, and then believe God for more and do it again and do it again and do it again and be patient because it will get there and it will increase. Plus, on the other hand, we're not called Realize we even when I read our, va our, um, our vision, it talks about impacting as world changers. We talk about world changers, our immediate world, though, and all those we come in contact with. People miss that part of the vision, think world changers like we're going to take on the globe. And as a ministry whole, sure, I could even see that. But as one location, our job is to take care of our immediate vicinity and those we come in contact with. And do our best to take care of that and do our part. That's part of serving. All right. Um, that was a little side note, but let me keep it moving here now. Um, Jesus uh, served, and really, really how he served God ultimately was by loving people and treating people right. Jesus served God by loving others. Sometimes we can get so busy serving God, we forget really serving God is loving others. We get so busy, people get so, and I'm going to touch some of those old source. people get so bent out of shape trying to hold everybody accountable. Well, it's the Sabbath on Saturday, the Sabbath on Sunday. We want to fight over the Sabbath and we're not realizing under grace, Jesus is our Sabbath, by the way, and there was a lot more spiritual context to that than just an actual date. Um, but in the Jew, in the, uh, you can read all through the Gospels where they get mad at Jesus because he, he worked on the Sabbath, necessarily healed on the Sabbath. And he would challenge them all the time. Is it so busy to honor a day of Sabbath to watch someone suffer? Or is it, more be is it better to serve and relieve the suffering? Is that what God's heart was really saying? And so we have to be careful we don't get caught up with our rules and traditions trying to honor God. We ignore loving people. That's what Jesus showed us. Let me keep it moving here because I'm going to run out of time. I'm still actually pretty good on time. Um, Here's something about serving you need to know when you talk about we learned out from Jesus. Serving flows not out of obligation, but thanksgiving to God. If you are serving to try to earn something from God, if you're serving trying to appease God, if you're serving trying to get anything like righteousness or any of those things, it's going to be miserable and it's going to be in vain. Serving is an overflow of just love and thanksgiving for God. That's what it is. When you come to church to serve, if it's not from a place of, man, I just want to do this now. I'm not talking about, don't get me wrong, there's, there's mornings I've got up and I'm like, let me go back to bed. I don't want to do this today because I'm just tired. There's a difference in that. You're going to feel your body. You're going to feel your emotions, man. You work a long day. You come off a 60-hour week and then it's like, man, how am I going to serve on Sunday morning? You know, there's that aspect of it. But what I'm talking about is this obligation of, 
man, if I don't do this, what's going to happen? God's going to get me. Or, you know, if I don't do this, is, is God going to bless me? Or what's going to happen? The cause, consequences of fear. That's not why we serve. We serve out of an overflow of, man, God, you've been good. Let me sow into what I believe. I'm casting vision for you to invest in. And serving is how you invest in this vision, by taking care of the people. Taking care of the people, not just taking care of me. That's not the bigger deal. Take care of the people that are coming through the doors. Now let's take care of the people that we have an honor to shoulder to shoulder, partner with, and reach out to our community. That's what it's all about at the end of the day. Um, now, our ability to serve. Now, this is the part where people, people get caught up in think, you know, because I don't hammer down on laws, don't do this sin, don't do that sin, don't do this sin. You want to know why? First of all, the law increases sin. So if I preach, don't do this a bunch of time, you're going to go out and do it. But I do teach people and tell people, which is scriptural from what Paul was talking about, to not let things dominate your life. There are things that get in the way of your ability to serve and impede your ability to serve. That aren't sometimes always worth it. There are things you should not let dominate your life. There are things where people are like, man, should I do weed or should I not do weed? Well, sometimes I see people, and, and, and we walk in love in our church. There's people that come in high as a kite. And, uh, and, and I'm not really against people doing that as much as the part when they try to serve and stuff like that, and they can't focus. They're all over the place. They, they, they're missing cues or they're missing, hey, this person's going by. You're supposed to do something or say something. We got a problem there. Because now that's impeding your ability to serve and do what God's called you to do. Is it mastering your life? Now, some people get mad at me about that. You know, it's legalized to do that. I don't care if it's legal or not. That is not the point. You're making it about that, and that's an excuse. Are you committed more than serving yourself in that moment to serving others? And if this is getting in the way of you serving the people around you, and serving in your church, and serving your family, by the way, then you might need to change that. And there's no judgment in that. There's not me hate, hitting on you or hating on you or anything like that. I've allowed things to creep in my life in the past that have started to take me out of the game, that started impeding my ability to, to serve and serve my family and things like that. And I had to say, you know, it's just not worth it. It's just not worth giving that up. I have to just give that up because... They're worth more than me. You, but sometimes you have to realize what's more valuable in life. To set those things aside. And it's called picking and choosing your priorities. And sometimes when this thing, get, you get things in the right order and your right priorities, things flow better in your life. And flow better in your heart. See, when we make it all about sin and not sin, it, it just turns into a bunch of religious zealot garbage and, you know, a bunch of this and that. Let, let's make it about what it really is. What's your priority in life? Are you letting things that don't need to master you in your life master your life? I mean, people want to focus on drinking or alcohol or something like that. Hey, some people, they can let video games rule their life. If you have to come home and play six hours worth of video games every night and you got a job and you got a wife to take care of and kids and everything else, and it's getting in the way of being a productive husband and being a productive wife, I mean, uh, yeah, wife too also, being a productive spouse, we might have a problem. You might need to throw it out. And I say that because it's funny because, you know, it, and, and I say this because, you know, I, I play video games. I, if people are like, you play video games, Wes? Yeah, of course I play video games. Video games are fun. I enjoy that. Um, but I don't let it control my life. I don't let it dominate other areas of my life where it becomes a problem now where it's like I have responsibilities I have to take care of around the house and I'm too busy playing a video game instead of to go take care of my wife. That's a problem. Somebody's feeling shame. They, they ain't liking me on that. I told you guys, I'm like, I don't know if I like this new role for you, Pastor Wes. Um, but it's, I told you guys earlier in the series, pastoring has got to tell you the truth in love. That's what we're going to do. We have to tell you in love. Now let me go to the scripture because you're like, ah, let me see how I can get out of that. Let me give you some scripture. If you want to get out of it, you, you'll just get out of it. It's what it really is. But let me go to some scripture here. Let's go to the, see what the Bible has to say about these things. Uh, let's go to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter um, 10. Chapter 10, verse 23. Verse 23. 
It says, you say I'm allowed to do anything. This is Paul talking here. But not everything is good for you. You say I'm allowed to do anything, but not everything is beneficial. That's what we have to recognize. If this is, you know, something you're doing, it's destroying your body to where you're going to shorten your lives by 20 years. You might want to stop it because you need to be on this earth long for your family and everything else. Whatever you got to do, if it's not beneficial to your life, man, some things you just got to cut out just because it's not readily sin or not sin. It's just not beneficial to you maximizing what God's doing in your life. All right. Um, let's go to chapter 6 of 1 Corinthians. So 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse, um, which verse? 12. It says here in verse 12, You say I'm allowed to do anything, but not everything is good for you. And even though I am allowed to do anything, I must not become a slave to anything. Simple as that. I must not become a slave to anything. I cannot let anything dominate and control my life. If it dominates and controls my life, and it is a thing that is taking me away from God, taking me away from loving others, taking me away from serving, taking me away from doing what I know God has called me to do, then I need to drop it and let that go. That's important. That's going to be important if you're being a part of this vision. Because we're going to challenge you in all areas. Being a part of this vision, walking in grace, walking in love, man. We're going to challenge you to be the best spouse you can be, the best parent you can be, the best child you can be, the best in everything you can be to bring honor to God. All right. And this is all about serving others. If it impedes your ability to serve others and love others as God has called you to do, you need to get it out of the way. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 9 now. 1 Corinthians 9. Let's read verse 19. Paul talks about this here, being able to minister to others and serving others. Even though I am a free man with no master, I have become a slave to all people to bring many to Christ. Now let's break down what that is. I have become a servant, actually, is a better translation for that. When I was with the Jews, I lived like a Jew to bring the Jews to Christ. What is he talking about? Typically, many times, he's going to give reference to the eating and ceremonial meals. You know, uh, so... When I was with those who followed, followed the Jewish law, I too lived under the law. Even though I am not subject to the law, I did this so I could bring Christ. I could bring to Christ those who are under the law. Many times I can remember in my past, I've, I've, I've worked with other dom denominations. Even though it's what we call, quote unquote, word of faith. I worked with Baptists, um, Methodists, uh, Pentecostal, different things along the lines and served along the lines with the church. Why? Because we agreed on Jesus at the end of the day. But it was also so they can come in contact with love. And I didn't let the fact that we didn't agree on everything. Like I was around people that believe God made you sick. Well, I didn't get all mad because I knew better. I knew God didn't make you sick. But for the opportunity to be around people and love on them and connect to them and see them as people, I realized that wasn't going to threaten my faith or threaten who I was in any way. And there's at times we got to learn how to lay aside our egos and our pride and our point and say, it's all right. I went around people that, you know, sat and people get upset. I go hang out with friends or something. They're all sitting in the middle of a bar drinking and smoking and doing different things. And I'm going to hang out with them. Now, are you drinking and smoking? No, I realize that's not the best for my body and the best way to serve it. So I don't do that. Not that I'm anti any of that. But it doesn't bother me every way because, man, if it gives a moment for me to love on you and you to see a moment of glimpse of Jesus in me, that's worth it. Because I also remember I'm not higher and mighty than them and I'm still doesn't make me better than them. And many of the times our, our moments to kind of distance ourselves from people is because we think we're better than them. We can't call everything toxic. Some things are toxic. We got to distance that. But we, we call stuff sometimes toxic when it's really we're the toxic person. And we're just weak as Christians and don't know how to serve people beyond our self-centeredness. All right, verse 19, back to that. Um, verse 20, 21. When I am with the Gentiles who do not follow the Jewish law, I too live apart from the law that, so I can bring them to Christ. What was I talking about? Well, you know, when I'm with the Jews, I, I don't eat pork and we, we stick with the fish. 
You know, we eat our, our, our salmon is what we do and our, our, our fresh vegetables. When I'm with the Gentiles, you know, oh, it's like, man, we, we're out there now grilling uh, pork ribs is what we're doing. Eating the pig, man. Man, so I chow down some good barbecue pork ribs with them. Why? Because neither one of them, I understand, has anything to do with actually salvation at all. But the greater thing is me being served and them connecting and getting a glimpse of Jesus. All right. When I am with the Gentiles who do not follow the Jewish law, I too live apart from the law so that I can bring them to Christ. But I do not ignore the law of God. I obey the law of Christ. What is that love? Love. The law of Christ is love your neighbor as yourself or as you have seen me, love others. And that's ultimately what we're servanthood is all about the last things i want to point out i'm about out of time here so let me just point these and let's and we'll keep it moving of course we read last week not being seen you can't serve to be seen that's matthew 6 that's self-centeredness um and you can't do it for the love of money you can't do it for the love of money it's like should the church pay us or not or this or that it's it's not all about whether the church is paying or you or not you know, I met people where we, we, we pay certain people, certain people we don't, certain people it's different what we're able to as a church because at the end of the day, it's, it's people's giving that allows us to do that. We are very mindful of it and we try to be the best stewards we can. But it's not whether we get paid, it's when it's all about the money. And then before you can even do anything, it's what do I get paid first? Or where's this at first? And we're, I'm not preaching against because some people, you know, they'll take this because it's like, well, I'm, I'm on staff or I'm on contract, Pastor West. You talking about me? No, if you get paid and we, we designate that, praise God, you know. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. There's a difference when you love money, though, and you're doing it only for the money. Because I, I can tell the difference of, it, you know, we got people that get, you, you get people that get paid and they're, they're there like that you think they were a volunteer because they are there. I say that as a, a positive thing because they're there so much they work outside the paycheck. There are people that are like, man, yes, thank God. I'm, they were servants before they got paid. We started paying them and we're able to bring them on because our church grew and we needed more around the church and needed them around the church more. So they couldn't, you know, we needed them to be here like 40 hours a week, but they still had to go home and pay their bills. So we, we brought them on and paid them and they, they're over here still working the 40 and then serving an extra 10 here and there. That's because you don't love money. Then you got other people we pay just as much and they're like, uh, they're looking the clock, you know, how to get out of here and, you know, shortcuts around there and this and that. And it's all about, you know, me getting paid and, you know, all these different things. It's, it's, it's a mixture of love for money. And so you're like, Wes, are you talking about anybody in particular? No, I, I'm talking about a heartbeat here. But I'm also having to be really straightforward in this new season because um, we're, we're changing gears. We're resetting vision. We're not being so loose just to say, hey, we're going to pay somebody or not pay somebody or this and that. We're really going to judge some things. We're really going to see if this is a necessity, if we need this around here. We're really about being. Remember, I just read, um, if it's not expedient, we're not going to do it. If it's not the best interest of being able to serve what God has called us, we're not going to do it. And so we want to be able to be in a position to do what God has called us to do and it can't be money driven where everything's making decisions. I got to do it by money. Even me, I still have to guard my heart. It's not even always about getting paid or not. It's about, you know, am I making a decision based completely off money in regarding the overall well affairs of the church? Am I going to push this thing with money and say, oh, we got to hurry up and make these decisions or we can't do this or never do this or never do that. And we, we got to make sure we're doing it with the right reasons. Why ultimately... That scripture, we all know you can't serve God in money. You cannot serve God in money. I'll read, read this last scripture. It's like, Wes, what are you talking about? And then I'll close out right here. And I don't mean to end off a negative. This is a warning to take heed, to not get lost in this. Because the enemy will try to drag you over into this stuff. Let's go to John 10. Wrapping up this part about not serving from a place of money because Jesus didn't do it for that reason. John 10. Let's do verse 10. The thief's purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy. My purpose is to give them rich and satisfying life. Verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd sacrifices his life for the sheep. A hired hand 
Catch this. This is what I wanted to read. A hired hand will run when he sees a wolf coming or trouble. He will abandon the sheep because they don't belong to him and he isn't their shepherd. And so the wolf attacks them and scatters the flock. The hired hand runs away because he's working only for the money and he doesn't really care about the sheep. It's exactly what it says in the NLT right there, the verse 13. So what are we talking about? What is the easiest way to tell people are just doing it for the money? See what happens when trouble and pressure comes up. When the trouble and pressure gets really high and really hot, do they abandon ship? Do they run? And to say anybody has nailed this perfect, including myself, nobody has. Some of this may be simply, hey, maybe you don't need to, we don't need you in such a high position yet. Maybe we need to, to work you a little bit, mature you a little bit, make sure you're well seasoned a little more, then promote you on some things and start you off on a smaller level of leadership. Start in smaller level roles. Sometimes it's that. But sometimes it's people who haven't made a quality decision to say, you know what, I'm here. Hell or high water, as they say, I'm here. When problems come, I'm here. When things don't look good and they're uncomfortable and they're tough, it gets tough, I'm here. That's the truth of leader and leadership and serving. And that's how to tell if you're um, in it for the money or not. Hired hand will be like, yeah, it's just money, I'm out. I can't do that anymore. Someone who's here beyond the money, even if they're getting paid, they'll say, I'm going to stick with it. And I'm going to give it my all. And that's what I encourage you to do. I know it's like, Wes, that's a weird way to end it. Well, kind of out of time is what it is, really. But I got through all my notes also at the same time. But my encouragement, man, is I hope you're catching vision through all this. I hope you caught the vision in part one. I hope you catch the vision of uh, a part two where we're a place where we want people to grow and be nurtured to grow and, ch- and see change in life. Three, you know, we talked about your place and being secure in your place. And then four, being about actively serving and what serving looks like. Because hopefully when you walk away and you go back and listen to this, you can say, that's what serving actually looks like. And is it complete? No, it'd probably take a few more weeks for me to get it all out. But that's where we're going to kind of wrap it up tonight. But I encourage you to get involved. This is where we're going. This is vision casting. As we open the church back up, these things are going to be vital To our current volunteers, I need you to get these messages on the inside of you so you can understand how things are operating, the culture, the mindset we want to create. Why? Because our church will be so much healthier with this working on the inside of us. Every bit of this will grow. You'll see the church do things this. You're like, how, well, what about, the bless, what about my blessings on this? Well, first of all, the fact you're making it all about that is problematic. And you need to go back and really re-listen to this. But you don't realize when you settle into these things, some of those things just work themselves out. And some of those things become apparent what the next stage is. Let me tell you, you can't help but to follow God in your lane and lift others and not be lifted yourself. You can't. It's like jumping into water. You can't help but get wet. And that's what this is. I hope you got something out of this. So here's what I want to shift gears towards. If you have never made Jesus Lord of your life, and get in on this amazing grace. Don't deny him kind of pinching at you there, kind of with the conviction there, kind of just putting that love and impression on you like, oh, I want to connect with you, Jesus. That's him reaching out. So repeat this prayer after me. Jesus, I receive your love. I receive your grace. I receive your forgiveness. And I make you Lord of my life. Amen. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, here's what I'd like you to do. I'd like you to text the keyword listed below there, I'm saved. That's all one word, I'm saved to 51555. That's I'm saved to 51555. Uh, once you do that, we'll uh, send you a free ebook, the one you can download digitally right there on your phone or, or laptop, whichever way you're viewing there. And I encourage you to read that book to get a better understanding of what you just prayed. But congratulations, and we celebrate you. Uh, those in the chat on a YouTube and Facebook page, man, make them feel welcome, make them feel loved, make them feel appreciated. 
uh, in, in every way. If you've already texted that number and you prayed that prayer for the first time, hey, throw it up in the chat of YouTube, uh, Facebook page so we can see you and celebrate you. But we are so glad and we thank God for the decision you made in your life and continue to connect with our church so we can grow with you. Uh, I look forward to seeing what God does in your life, though. The last thing, don't click off. Uh, we want to do uh, our giving and offering. Now, offering, we realize, is about a heart of gratitude. It's about a vision that we see God has called us to be a part of and sowing into that vision. But it's about being grateful because God has already blessed us. Now we're paying for that blessing. Remember, you're blessed first to be a blessing second. We love because He loved us first. We give because He's given to us first. That's the way grace works. So now we're no longer doing it out of compulsion or fear, trying to get something. We're doing it as an overflow of gratitude. And here's how you can do it. You can text the keyword WCCNY, space in the amount you want to give. That's WCCNY, space in the amount you want to give. You can text that to the number listed below. Uh, if you want to call, we have an 800 number for you to call. We got people on standby to receive uh, your calling, uh, your offering, excuse me and receive it safely and securely. Some people like to mail it in, so we got a P.O. box listed there. You can mail to that address right there. And then finally, if you're on our website, you can click that button there that says Give. When you click that button, it'll open up some options. you got a PayPal option for our international members. You can give that way. But whatever God is putting on your heart, that's what I encourage you to do. Do just that. Know that's enough. And if God has called you to be a part of this church, World Changers Church, New York, sow and invest in what you believe in, in this vision. And man, just watch what God does in this church, through you, through us, through our lives, and getting Jesus into the entire New York City area. And we thank you for partnering with us and sowing and believing in us as we believe in you also. All right, hold those up and let's pray over them. Heavenly Father, thank you for everyone that is under the sound of my voice. We give this gift of love because we've been blessed first and now we're honoring you with the blessing that you have shown us we are just being a blessing to others we are sowing to this vision of world changers church new york saying thank you god for everything you're doing in our church and will continue to do church we declare every budget is met every bill is paid every need is met we declare it over our members we declare it over our church building we declare it over everyone partnering with us we declare it over every life your breakthrough and your financial aid, because you are the God that meets all of our needs. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. All right, please tune in to these announcements following, and then you'll come right back, and I'll pray us out.